Hi everyone, this is going to be a bit different of an episode, as I'm not broadcasting this live on Twitch first to then post up for YouTube. I'm making this as a direct-to-YouTube video, uh, complete with a cat already on the desk here. Uh, on Saturday night, we normally take the week's worth, uh, worth of effort and work that we uh, made into a five-person party, a map, and we include some, some tips for DMs and PCs. And we condense it all together into a campaign, into a story of some kind that you can use as a springboard to write a, a short story of your own, heck, a novel, maybe even a campaign itself. Uh, since we really just put ideas together, like it's a series of events. And then it's up to you. Do you want to scale it for a level 10 adventure, a level 20, a level 2? Uh, that's up to you. And part of that process, we took page one of all five characters that we made over the course of the week, and we distilled them into a character sheet, quote-unquote, for the party itself, as the party is also an entity. And especially one that your DM is going to have to consider when writing your adventure, or as an author, you need to be able to weave these characters in and out, um, spotlight them, uh, d demonstrate their weaknesses, and uh, have them flex their strengths. This is a nice snapshot to show who's who in the party, uh, Hederika, we randomly generated as just a, a solo character building exercise as level 17. Her stats are higher, but that's not going to matter because we know the direction she's going to take. Strength is important to a paladin. So whether she's level 17 with a 20 strength or she's level uh, 1 with a 17 strength, right? Because you get a starting 15 and mountain dwarves get 2 strength. Is that 3 points going to matter in among those 16 levels? Uh, not for the not for what we're doing. We already know she's going to be the the strong person of the group. Um, so the the level of our individual characters doesn't matter too much. We see that we have uh, we do have a strong arm. We have uh, actually two faces. Uh, you can maybe say two and a half, right? Uh, our sorcerer and our warlock cast off charisma, so naturally they're going to be a little bit more, you know, forward in that sense. Uh, we have we kind of have a brain with Glint also, though intelligence isn't necessarily a strong point of the of the group. Um, you know, kind of average wisdom and constitution. This is actually a tougher than normal group, and maybe we can say, oh, this is this is what you get for growing up in Tianis, right? You you get a thick skin. Uh, we can make a colloquial say, you know, you get like an alligator hide or something along those lines. Uh, but we have a rather beefy group. So as a DM, uh, you you have like okay intelligence characters, and if we're if we want to run a murder mystery or something else to solve, you know, putting in puzzles that that is a split between the player and the character. Um, but maybe this turns into a little bit. Maybe you you weight it more slightly towards. Um, physical hazards, or a little bit more towards combat, as long, <laughs> the caveat being, as long as the combat advances the story, and it's not, in my opinion, just a random encounter for the sake of rolling dice and beating up monsters. Uh, so you, as the DM, can get together, because your, your party's already come, they, they said, oh, I'm going to play this type of character, I'm going to play this type of character, and, and go from there. And you can see their, uh, you can see their ability scores, their tool proficiencies, right? So we have disguise, disguise, um, thief, thief, um, and uh, dragon chest between these two. Which, by the way, this stuff, as a DM, maybe you can incorporate into your game. But as players, it's also acting as a bit of a bond. And we'll get to that when I show you what we've done with page two of all the characters. Uh, carpentry tools, brewing tools. Um, you can see their skills. If you have a question, if this was live on Twitch and someone hey said, "Hey, what's what's inv?" as a shorthand, what's investigation? That said, just look at the character sheet over here, and you should be able to figure it out. If you still have questions about something, leave a comment on the video. You'll also find down below, I will put links to each of the characters as they were created, so you can watch them come alive before your eyes. And maybe that will help 
things make more sense here if you don't just trust me to go along with uh, with this as a standalone episode. Which will be a little bit shorter, because we're doing everything in a condensed fashion, as uh, there's not a, a chat to interact with, or, you know, taking breaks and stretching. This is going to be a, you know, boom, forward, telling a story, we're, we're getting the band back together. <laughs> Um, so yeah, here's all our saves, and you'll see that this party sheet was filled out differently than the others because we have such an intimate group, and the adventure is going to take place in not a region that maybe even all of the characters, let alone players, know about. But as this has been set up, we have characters who've lived here their whole lives. This is an, uh, there's a, not necessarily intimate relationships between the characters, but they know of each other, and they each have opinions about each other. And this is going to cause us to tell the story differently than we did in Klabheim, or uh, even uh, or even uh, Lully Wellen's Folly uh, in the the prior incarnation. Okay, so you've had plenty of time to look at this. If not, then uh, pause the video and and take a look because now I'm going to shift over uh, to page two for Radia. And I'll go through each of the characters. I'll linger on here a little bit so you can pause it if you want to see their their front page stats. This is where we're getting into the concept of PCs being co-DMs. As we fill in, look at this. As we fill in page two, we are world building as PCs. And maybe as PCs, we sat down with the DM and we're looking for ways to to bring links in. Because as a player, obviously, you won't know about this homebrew area. And uh, as a character, though, you're going to know far more. As a DM, you're going to have to be aware of that and maybe sometimes speak through your your PC's mouths, though hopefully not too often. Or you can give them, you can write out a primer and, and give it to your players. Or just, just bear in mind that they will ask you questions. And this is going to be on you, then, as they're asking questions to make the world come alive as they interact with it more often. Because there's a big knowledge gap between y your character knowledge and your player knowledge. And in this case, it's usually reversed, right? We talk about meta knowledge. Like, oh, you as a player shouldn't know that, you know, drows are weak to sunlight and all this other stuff uh, because your character doesn't know. Well, in this case, the, the, table ha the tables have been turned. All right, so up here on page two, we have a box for allies and organizations. With what you saw above, the, the outline of the character... Um, she works for herself. She was this kind of like Dark Knight, Batman-ish character. The way that the descriptions are written is partial roleplay. This is reflecting how she talks, how she interacts. She's a bit like uh, Rorschach also from Watchmen, if you're familiar with that character. For instance, so this is her opinion on Sanvon. Cute. Shame that he plays tunes as he dances to the higher-ups. Still cute, and he actually knows poverty. Haderika. She has what I want, yet can never attain. Strong potential and a useful resource. Gwelevi. She'd be the perfect ally if she could think beyond her own needs. Why does crime pay more than justice? Slight jealousy. Glint. He understands but chooses to play their games. Waste of potential, but respected. This player, this imaginary player for this non-imaginary character, speaks in short, direct sentences. Very active voice. Uh, talks almost like, you know, tweets. Very direct tweets. We've built her character, and now we've built the world around this character and the things that she knows about the city, which as DMs, we can take into consideration. Now to go beyond the three boxes up here that don't offer too much more than basic reference for your character's looks, we can tell a little bit more of the story in additional features and traits. Yes, you could bring down, you know, if you want to put your feats here, you want to, uh, on page one, if, instead of just putting in the names of things, if you want to write it out and then you just continue it down here, you can do that. In this instance, because we're only using the above box as reference, this is allowing for a fuller description of her physically. Her more fiendish tendencies are reflected physically with her sharper chin, brow, and eyes that seem predatory by default. She's comfortable using her tail and horns as tools for intimidation. 
Her dark skin lends credence to her urchin name, the Golden Darkness, as her yellow eyes stand out against it, let alone her more adult pursuit for wealth to use against wealth. That must be these higher-ups that she has a grudge against. And if you go back up to the, the first page prior in the video, you'll, you'll see why. Her body is relatively free of scars or other markings as she chooses to shroud herself in various armors which might act as a projection of her loneliness. Still, she acts as a vigilante in Tianese, hoping that every bad person she stops and turns over to the militia will bring her one step closer to the doorstep of the quote-unquote higher-ups. <laughs> Boom. A minute pitch on who her allies are and how she views them. A minute pitch... I mean, I don't know, maybe it was two minutes if I was reading slowly and dramatically about how, what she looks like, accented by the character portrait. Um, and all of these are working together in some ways. And now here's our pitch on her backstory. What happened before we see her at age 31 as a, uh, as a fighter? Her first break as an urchin came when she managed to sneak into a wealthy city father's mansion, a, a city father's uh, kind of like a, a leader. Uh, maybe with hints of, um, you know, a very patronizing demeanor, maybe hints of corruption or kind of a good old boy uh, system. Into a wealthy city father's mansion and lifted a precious item, which she later sold for quite a sum. That she would come to find later was undervalued, but still. Since that first rush of justice and the sting of being taken advantage of by another, so you get this nice yin-yang thing going on, she has continued her quasi-legal personal quest to clean up the literal swamp of Tianese. While born into the minority tieflings that rule the city, she is a wanted figure and has no real influence, something she doesn't mind. Her forays here and there have had her rub elbows with agents of good and evil alike. This has, been a wa uh, this has her walk a perilous line between the two via her personal code. More stuff for you to take into consideration as a DM, and certainly um, guidelines for you as a player. You're not writing her into a corner. You're not writing her into a trope or a stereotype. Um, you've even left it open to yourself that the fact that she does go around in light armors, right? She's she's a dex fighter, um, or she has a decent one. You know, she can wear light armor. She goes heavy armor. Yet all these armors and the fact that she has this more pure body is symbolic of a reclusive nature. And that could change over the course of the campaign. In fact, I hope it does. There should be personal growth. But you didn't write she's an introvert and will never talk to people. Because now you've written yourself into a corner and it's, it can be difficult to break out of that very hard concept. She herself may talk forward uh, in a forward fashion, but she still has this soft inside. Even, even if you look up here, she, in this detective, noir, kind of like gritty uh, narrative, even realizes that there's this little bit of softness. Look, there's a slight jealousy uh, over Gwelevi. She respects Glint, even though he plays their games. You know, these higher-ups, that kind of a thing. So now that you've seen with our first character we generated uh, what we're doing, and you can compare her then. Here's Radia, and that's also why character concepts see the sheet. We have a whole concept here. <laughs> and uh, the DM should note particularly her bond, and you're going to get that in, I, I mean, really really these four, uh, these four items, I guess five if you want to count each personality trait. These are things that the DM should note, but particularly, I escape my life of poverty by robbing an important person, and I'm wanted for it. They're all going to have bonds that are going to be similar, and in fact, as a keen DM, you might be able to pick up on that and use that as a subtle hook to get everyone in on something. Also, and I'm going to wait till the end of the video, as I describe the party... And especially, keep in mind, this was completely random. We generated a city who has tieflings and halflings as the as the um, two major races. And randomly, we came up with two halfling characters, two tiefling characters, which in a developed in a pre-developed story like this is, has an interesting set of tension. And then you have the, the wild card uh, dwarf, who herself is chaotic good when we have two lawful neutrals, a lawful good, and a lawful evil. 
this this week was magical. If if you do not believe in uh, the magic of D and D, this this did it right. <laughs> this wasn't contrived. I, I didn't uh, you know I, this wasn't set up. So you got to trust yourself. Anyway, I, I think I've hit on that before. I'll say it again. So now that we've we've gone through this concept, let's go on to the second character we created in there and there on there on. And you'll get how everything was written out. And maybe you'll see a pattern as a viewer, as if you were a player, or as if you were a DM. So now we have San Von Quinster, who's a flugelist. Plays the flugelhorn. And he's also a ventriloquist. Scroll up to the top real quick. So here, if you want to take a, a look, if you want to pause the video and see his stats. These other things. Okay. So now I'm going to scroll down. I'm going past this top bar. So there we go. We made an order called the Guild of Oddfellows in our Talks of the City during Twitch stream. This never came up, but I as a player say, well, I want to belong to some kind of an actor's guild or something along those lines, or maybe he just made it up to sound even more important. All of a sudden, I as a PC have just contributed to the world and made it a richer place. His opinion on Radia. He would, pardon me. He wishes to know her more, but has used what he does as inspiration for songs. Often, they're hits. Seven out of ten. You're gonna have to look above if you want to know why he just said seven out of ten when also evaluating his character friend, his characters and his friends here. Haderika. Wild like is magic and alluring for it, but a bit too dangerous. Enjoys her exotic spice of thought and smell. 8 out of 10. Guelavi. Absolutely forbidden fruit. Tiefling? Check. Selfish and adventurer? An adventurous? Check. 10 out of 10. <laughs> and Glint. A boorish but somewhat handsome stick in the mud. Uh, well, stick in the swamp mud. A fellow professional and has much respect for that, especially because his life would make for a great book. 6 out of 10. <laughs> Hopefully you're catching things now. It's making sense. Additional features and traits. His skin lightened after he could afford more roofs over his head, but he still has some premature wrinkles by his eyes from squinting all the time, making him look a bit older than he is. While he dresses as a quote-unquote noble while on stage to the amusement of many, when he's not at home, he lives simply and frugally. The best disguise he can wear while out in public is by being in his normal clothes, especially as he still has the twang and slang of someone living the rural life. Remember, this Atenis is, is a really an agricultural city on the vast outskirts. There is a, a core to it, um, but a lot of the population are halflings, and a lot of them are agrarian in lifestyle. His hairstyles become more popular among the residents of Tianis as they squeeze a gelatinous substance from the roots of a species of cattail into their hands and rub it into their hair to solidify it in place for a few hours. We effectively invented hair gel. Did this exist in our description of Tianis? No. But as a player said, you know, based on the description, you know, we, we used the photo that we found uh, through a Google image search. We added to the world. We made it, we made it light up. And compare his opinion to Radia as Radia's opinion was to Sanvon. Just something to consider. Sanvon wasn't born into wealth nor attention. He earned both as the son of rice farmers singing in the swamp paddies during harvest. He was recognized by a patron when he showed off his other skills through a talking bag of grain worked into a puppet. It was stolen and the patron took him in and gave him a new one. It's not the same and one day he'll get it back. Who would want such a thing anyway? He is courteous despite his warm heart being tugged in all directions now that he has fame and some fortune. His agricultural roots, pun intended, he insists, keep him from getting in too much trouble when the feelings overtake logic. His magic, he thinks, is an expression of his fiery soul, which somewhat bothered him since that one time pink bubbles came out of his mouth when he tried to speak. That's a little subtle hint on his wild magic and what happens during it. And if you check out his um, his spell list, and you can pause there, but I'm going to go back up and proceed. Now we're going to come over to Haderika and and Geckner. We'll get a mention. This is uh, this is her sheet. Here we go. 
pause it if you need to. Okay, going down. There's the rest of it. Going down further, there's the top line of page two. And now we're getting to the meat and taters of this uh, Dwarven Paladin. Radia. Admires her as a fellow hunter, but feels a loss that she's fighting for the city and not against it. As she is anyway. Uh, as in that, That's referencing as Haderika is fighting against the city. Sanvon. Good songs and stories, enjoys a good drink. His use of talent seems wasted. His wild magic is great. Remember, we have the chaotic good uh, character. And we have the lawful good character in Sanvon. So they, they both enjoy promoting society and life and not hurting other people. Well, I gotta be careful with that. <laughs> but she likes the fact that he, he actually breaks out and these seemingly random things happen when he otherwise tries really hard to carry himself as a good and productive member of society. And she's just like, ah, burp, fart, and cuss in public. You know, live life. Opa. Gwelevi. She understands that the way things are needs to change and is a quote-unquote personal project to work on. Sister-like. Glint. A symbol of the city itself, she enjoys toying with him and using him as bait for a bigger game. Right? So she has this inspiration that she wants to bring down the, you know, the city. That kind of gives her the same goal as Radia with these higher-ups. Though, uh, though we see that Haderika has different, different people, or rather different reasons, different roads to take her to the same destination. Um, and so Glint himself isn't a bad person, but because he works for the city, maybe she can use him as bait, being this hunter. You know, again, we're using terms that are appropriate to the personality of this character. As for her looks, she has small tattoos, scars, and other marks on her body based on the wrong she's put to rights. Over her heart, upon her left breast, is a space saved for her final challenge. She doesn't know what that is yet, but is ready for it when it arrives. Her eyes themselves are dark like coal and glint in her dark sockets as she seeks her next target. Piled atop her dirt-flecked body, freckled face, and uh, body with crag and curve alike is a shock of beautiful honey hair that very few have seen worn down. When she smiles, you see several teeth have been knocked out and were put on a necklace. There are ten times as many of others' teeth on the same necklace, which she considers a fair exchange. Her backstory. Born upriver from Tianis, she was raised in a dwarven city that traded with the city. Her bond with the earth grew, and after becoming an adult, she left the mountain to discover the different terrains around the area. During this time, she saw the earth and soil abused, not respected as she was taught by her people. There she vowed to fight on behalf of the lands that couldn't themselves. Eventually, she followed the river south and found familiar makers, uh, maker's marks. She settled in the area to learn more if these people were the source of the corruption and development. Now caught up in the city's web of intrigue, she has lived here for several years in her continued quest. Before she can land the final blow for justice, she's taken, over, uh, she's taken other jobs as a bounty hunter. She fights alongside, or rather atop, her summoned Mount Gechnir, the Battle Donkey. The only creature who can match her stubbornness. Have we painted a vivid picture of Haderika? Just by listening to this. It, yeah, and you can look at the illustration. And she's with some organization called the Earthkin. Has this helped you to really bring her to life and understand her? Maybe you're already thinking two steps ahead in, in the things that she's doing here. In the way she's going to carry herself. The way she speaks. Again, we, we're, we're using guidelines and we're having fun kind of bouncing in between them. Next up, uh, we have uh, Gwelevi. Gwelevi Nendri. Scroll up. Here's her page one. Pause if you need to. Remember, all of this was randomly generated. And so what we're doing after this was based on the outline. And now we're coloring in the outline that we, that we made. All right. Now here's the reveal of the top line, the little summary of Gwelevi. And now let's get into it. She's a part of the Order of Conflux. What is that? We never developed that in the city uh, during the Twitch sessions. Well, hey, as a player, where did she learn her monk abilities? What's around her? You know, where, where was she developing these martial arts? 
well, we created a place. And you know what? As a DM, if you as a PC are creating something, that means you're invested in it. And if you're invested in the game, you're paying attention and you're helping to have it come alive and not just place the burden on me, pardon, not just place the burden on me as the storyteller to have it, you know, dance and sing in front of you when I don't know which songs you like. So as a DM, empower your PCs to have a foot in the door in the world somewhere. Okay, this is how she regards Radia. Often a cat and mouse game between them. Friendly rivalry of two women in mutually dire straits and sense of justice. Shared respect. Remember, we have the lawful neutral kind of Batman Rorschach style um, person. And then we have this uh, lawful evil monk who's a criminal smuggler. But she's not evil for the sake of, you know, wanting to throw babies into the swamp and kick kittens and all that. Uh, as you as you would have seen above, she has a very re she has a reason to do things the way that she's doing. Sanvon enjoys teasing his heart and his loins as she uses his performance. You gonna come up? There we go. There's another cat for you all. Enjoys teasing his heart and his loins as she uses his performance events often as a cover for her activities without him knowing. Firmly in the ally zone, romantically yet still a true friend. Aye, just don't. Don't lay on the keyboard, please. Haderika, her best friend despite being a polar opposite personality. They get along well as sisters of a sort. Also useful for covering her smuggling activities. They try to outdo each other. Glint, a friend and someone she wants yet probably can never have, making her desire for him even more. He's a staunch ally in her opinion, and he makes her feel guilty for her choices. What? How can that be? How does that even make sense, right? We have a lawful neutral investigator for the city, and we have someone who's pretty much a known criminal. Maybe not a, a mastermind or the kingpin, but she does smuggle things. Maybe like maybe roguish like a Han Solo type, right? Well, we'll find out. Bearing scars from a failed punishment by the Thieves' Guild, hers match Glintz, who bore a portion of her fate when he intervened in the ritual. Her keen eyes are a solid fluorescent orange and very wide, sometimes necessitating goggles during nighttime smuggles to avoid being easily spotted. Her more human-sided heritage influences her personality of wanting and needing to do selfish acts to prove herself and possibly is the safety net keeping her from falling fully into the waters and mists of true villainy. As well, she had her horns manipulated through transmutation to sweep backwards, allowing for easier cowled adventures. She keeps her hair, her dyed hair in braids, swept, oop, I misspelled that, and swept back, forming into a ponytail to complement her twisted horns. Again, we've now used, uh, we've given to the city and we've taken from the city. We know that there's a school of transmutation here, and she's using this in ways to help her in what she's doing, a little bit of cosmetic surgery, so to speak. Left on her order's entrance gateway, Gwella V was raised by the cloistered monks. Their stringent routines taught and strengthened her, but the confines of the monastery weren't enough for her quote-unquote halfling spirit. Again, we just sort of made up a we made up a phrase, right? Halflings live here. They're actually the majority race, despite the tieflings being in charge. She practiced sneaking out and sneaking things in while also learning the way of the four elements. She eventually, by virtue of a, gen a generous patron who caught her, let her go and paid the order of conflux to allow him her services, started taking on jobs for him of dubious morals in order to now pay off her freedom, as such as it is, or is not, from him. Does this make sense? We had this order of conflux, right? She's a student of four elements. And how are we going to work this in? Well, we gave her very watery, like flowing river and water whip, right? Think of the map, think of the location. Is anything else showing a pattern yet that you've seen to the party? If not, hang on, we got one more to go. The final party member is Glint Stillwater. Let's go up, here's his page one. Pause it if you need to, especially pay attention, personality traits, ideals, bonds, because those had more influence over abilities and spells and all of that than just pure numbers and math alone. Okay, here's the bottom. Here's the top of page two. And now let's get into him. This is his opinion on Radia. Sympathizes with her cause, doesn't like her methodology. In some ways, they are two sides of the same coin and cross paths frequently. 
San, because remember, she's the, she's also lawful neutral, but she's the vigilante out for justice, and he's the one who works for the government seeking justice. Mm, pardon me. Sanvan sees him as both an asset and a sellout for Glint's cause. Friendly otherwise, even if Sanvan's optimism and romantic pursuits seems foolish. Haderika, begrudgingly effective in aiding some investigations with her skills. Remember, she's like the bounty hunter, right? Glint can only tolerate her in small doses. He thinks some of her past arrests were just ex excuses to spend time together. Gwilavi realizes she isn't truly a bad person. He still disapproves of her demeanor and lifestyle. Won't admit a fascination with her and works uh, with her on occasion to quote unquote keep her honest. You know, it's that I can fix you mentality of someone that you might have an interest, a romantic interest in. So seeds are planted, whether or not they'll bear fruit, we'll have to see, right? As the story goes on, as the players take over and react to things happening and going from there, but there's potential. We haven't written ourselves into a corner. Now, uh, this is what he looks like. Remember, he was mentioned in another person's uh, story. Well, let's get the rest of it. Let's get the other side of it. His skin has some acid scars from interrupting a punishment ritual used by the local thieves' guild. This formed a tenuous relationship with Gwelevi Nendri, who was to be the recipient. Due to his otherworldly pact, when he uses his invocations, his irises seemingly swirl slowly. Unbeknownst to him, this mimics the portal underneath the swamp's waters, which is a gateway to his patron. Glint often believes the fog whispers to him, as, and he sees shapes, real or imagined, moving through the Mixla, which is the effervescent mists. As well... He has aspirations to one day rule from a high position, holding the thieves and uh, disproportionately ruling tieflings to justice and making uh, Tianis a better place beneath him. Because... Bing, bing, bing. Put that, put that away. No one needs to see the Eye of Sauron. <laughs> His background, well, his backstory. Born to a wealthy and influential halfling family, a minority in the majority of Tianis, Glint grew up educated and seeking to extend his privileges past the station he shared with most tieflings and a handful of other halfling families. After falling into the swamp trying to help a shape he thought was struggling and crying out, he received a connection to his patron which only empowered him to pursue his dreams, albeit methodically. His slow yet constant successes has built him up to be uh, somewhat haughty. In Tianis, there is a saying, Og Nuktal a Og Narid, or the jewelry or the sword. Essentially, this means taking a bribe to the hand or find yourself taking a blade to the heart. He wears expensive jewelry that depicts swords in mock of this phrase and secretly savors the irony of receiving his mystical power from his glittering pact blade. And here we have gaseous form, dimension door, right? The very mobile, lots of, uh, lots of powers for movement. It's very airy going from there. You're right. He talks to the mists. Uh, he thinks he sees shapes in them. He has a connection to this, uh, this portal to the plane of elemental air. Have you gotten what we've just done? Somewhat like based on random events, but that we've been able to navigate into almost a poetic beauty. Air. Air powers. Way the four monks. Water powers. This order of conflux, right? The, the, the four elements coming together. Earth kin. She's, she wants to save the earth, the soil, from development, from being exploited. Sanvon's fire, uh, his uh, sorceress fire powers, his fiery soul. One, two, three, four. Air, water, earth, fire. Maybe not heart for Captain Planet, but if you know anything about the, uh, the five rings or the five elements, there's also the element of void, of nothingness, of that which connects what lies between... Uh, air molecules 
It's that space. It's that nothingness. It's something that is arguably more pervasive than things themselves. Is this is the things in between? Five members of the party. Five elements. As Radia is this gap. Hey, how about that? Ah, uh, so now the story. We've almost already, you know, we, we've told a lot about the city already. And this campaign formation sheet isn't going to be as relevant for what we want to discuss here. Um, you still can bring up the heroic journey, you know, this cycle, this 12 step, uh, this, uh, 12 step cycle here, but this is really two thirds of this happens in the other world, in the underworld, in the magical world, detached from where we're going to be. That's not necessarily going to be the case with this story or this campaign. And so I want to give you things to consider, things to think about as we make this uh, framework. Uh, yeah, I can type out some, but as we're making this in our heads, the characters already have a very good knowledge of where they're at. And the DM has presumably already said the, this adventure is going to be taking place in Tianese. Okay, so we're, we would have to modify this, this traditional format some. Did you see any other consistencies between the characters? And again, as we randomly rolled them, uh, as we randomly rolled things, I escaped my life of poverty by robbing an important person, and I'm wanted for it. Somebody stole my precious instrument, and I'll someday I'll get it back. This one is a little bit more open. An injury to the unspoiled wilderness of my home is an injury to me. Was there some kind of a new and recent development, especially one that was uh, destructive, in her opinion, uh, to uh, to nature and to the earth itself? I'm trying to pay off an old debt I owe to a generous benefactor. Nothing is more important than other members of my family. I secretly believe that everyone is beneath me. Although we have him as kind of the investigator looking into all this. And not everything will always match up, but you're seeing that they have these, they have bonds, and bonds aren't just something you write out of the PHB. They should inspire your character and your DM alike to make a story. As it was presented, this is a place that does have magic. It has uh, religious, uh, like uh, religion-based magic, arcane-based magic, nature-based magic. Uh, it does have a criminal element, right? It a river flows into the swamp and then eventually finds it, uh, the waters find their way out into a split. But there's plenty of opportunity for crime, right? Everything is kind of always misty, right? We we randomly generated this this portal to the elemental plane of air. It makes the whole swamp like soda water, like seltzer water. It's churning. There's always these mists kind of clinging around. So a lot of the city is built above those mists on stilts or on these uh, several little like sandbar islands and the the ruling like the actual like executive level is built on the edge of the swamp on a hill where the waters don't reach you have trade a large population lots of money coming through and constant mists you better believe that there's going to be some kind of a criminal enterprise going on and so now we can write a crime story we can weave together uh, everyone and use their use their skills, use their strengths and their weaknesses. <laughs> Here we go, right? 20 strength, 8 dex. 8 strength, 19 charisma. Glint is an investigator, and he can interview people and get things done. We gave him a baton, you might have noticed, because it was thematic, right? He's a police officer of some kind. He should have a nightstick or something along those lines. Although, I mean, let's face it, he's probably going to make that, you know, he's going to project his packed blade onto it or something. Um, but he needs to look the part so people don't get the wrong idea. And we can take them throughout the city of Tianese to the, loca uh, to the location. So instead of just saying um, the order of conflux, an entire confrontation of some kind can bring them there and then through the eyes and words of 
um, of uh, Guinevere's, uh, um, yeah, uh, Guinevere, of uh, Guinevere's character, if not player. I mean, maybe as the DM, you put the, you you printed out a flyer and you gave uh, some information specifically for that player to route through his or her character, or through that character's eyes and words, she gives him the tour, and then an investigation begins. You know, do you like case closed? Do you like Sherlock Holmes? Do you like this kind of a thing? Well, you as a DM uh, can set a you know can set the tone and highlight different areas of the city that yeah all the characters may know about. I'm sure everyone has heard that there's this uh, there's this monastery. It might not it doesn't have to be sprawling or at the top of a mountain, obviously, uh, but it's called the Order of Conflux. There's at least a handful of monks that have at least a neutral reputation among people. They're there because this seems to be a con a, a place of conflicts, right? We have a swamp, which is er like very soggy, earthy water. There's this air presence to it. And because everything is, um, everything is degrading quickly in the swamp, it's breaking down. There's, you know, there's these hints that uh, there could be flare ups, right? It's like natural gases and methane and whatnot can either be harvested and used. And so maybe instead of oils or whatnot, uh, there's actually some sort of like pipes that go into the water and, uh, and just are gas collectors. And so you actually get heat and light in, in kind of a gaslight fashion from the swamp. And so fire is still is prevalent because fire is also, you know, these places aren't all made from brick and stone. A lot of it's made from reed and wood and other things. And so fire is, is present too. Um, or, or the Order of Conflux set up shop here because they saw that there were three very strong elements and wanted to bring balance by having these uh, these people focus on fire. Now, that didn't necessarily uh, be imprinted on uh, on uh, Guelaviv, but uh, I mean, not everyone has to be that specialist. You get what I'm saying now? So we go there. We discover what we talked about before, that there's this un, uh, that there's this kind of underwater, underground uh, Thieves' Guild for the Climbers. And the Climbers, as we're going through Thieves' Camp, is the name for the Thieves' Guild because the Thieves are known as Aspirants. And it has this quasi-religious tone because Thieves can't always kind of did, right? Oh, well, we're good guys. We're Thieves. Um, and major religions have set up here, uh, particularly Knowledge and nature because this is a very natural area knowledge is partially for arcane you know so you, like think more magic-y clerics like wizard cleric blends without being multi-classed because you have this portal but this is a place of knowledge because it's also a place of training and now that we have this holy presence and we have these rogues that are bringing in these holy terms you can even say that the trickery domain is a viable domain to be learned by clerics here I mean, I guess I shouldn't do that because that that is doesn't have to be a bad guy. Um, doesn't have to be a, like a, a bad guy domain. Um, but you're getting roguish clerics. You're getting wizard wizardy clerics. We're getting uh, druidy clerics. And then we have a school of transmutation. So obviously, wizards. You'll, you're going to get a lot more transmuters out here. Um, but that doesn't preclude other wizards from visiting or, you know, getting a certification or they want to see the library here because they, they might be a necromancer. Chat was having a lot of fun with uh, uh, supposing that a necromancer is coming into town with uh, some cheap labor and uh, there was a, a bit of a, dis a like a labor dispute over uh, should skeletons be roofing your house on the on the cheap. And um, and so there's this school of transmutation. You you as the DM now, let, let's put on our DM hats. You as the DM have a ton of options to run here. Locations. Who's Who can be the corrupt individual? And keep in mind, a lot of good detective stories have a red herring. And it's, it's a bit of a trope, but even if the red herring is actually the culprit, but there's someone else who's way too more obvious and not as sneaky and manipulative as the, as the real person. Could it be the head of the transmutation school? Could it be a cleric in one of the orders is manipulating things? It could even be an external threat. It could be a band of orcs is looking to sack the city at some point in time. And you could make the campaign about uh, shoring up the defenses. Well, you can't do that unless you're getting these guilds to cooperate, unless you're getting, you know, you're trying to get people to pull their money together, unless you're doing all of this. And that could take uh, the adventures all around the city and needing to use investigation skills to find out what needs done in order to bring harmony and peace 
if only momentarily and under an external threat of an invasion. Um, you can bring in, um, you know, it could, it could be a murder mystery. It could be a, um, a kidnapping. It could be extortion. Like if we want to go espionage and, and it's like a sneaking mission kind of Metal Gear stuff. Not everyone here is good at sneaking, especially Haderika. <laughs> um, but you can have so many elements. And naturally, combat, you can weave that in anywhere. You, you, combat should not be something you as a DM needs to worry about in a story. You can drop in conflict almost at any point. And even in a city location like this, given what we've described, you can have combat with natural creatures, supernatural creatures, and uh, and just normal, like, you run into some thugs uh, in the middle of an alleyway and they want to try and rob you. And maybe one of them's carrying a note to something, and so the, the battle has meaning, right? You, you put the thugs down and you discover the note and the adventure continues. So you don't need to have a mountain and a forest and a plains. And now we're talking about huge biomes, like individual regions themselves, um, to have a particular type of encounter. You can still have all of these things, especially with transmutation. You want to talk about a school that's going to accidentally make aberrations or purposely, if you want to weave that in. Um, maybe a wizard is unleashing aberrations uh, uh, into the world and they're taking up residence or... There's even, uh, at some point in time, an aberration was accidentally created, escaped into the swamp, and is now an invasive species and needs to be put down or something along those lines. You can weave in all of this stuff here. And again, you can even have undead. Bring in some necromancers or, you know, a mystery of some kind is occurring. Uh, so I, I don't want to talk about a specific quest chain or uh, like I want to give you campaign ideas here. We've made we've set up everything else for you. You have this map. You have a language. You have a random sampling of the population through these five characters and the things that they do and what they think and who they are and where they interact. You can go in the map and you can have uh, you can have a monk, you know, the leader of the monks be the staunchest, wisest ally or the leader of these of this monk order is is the villain. And then the players can set factions against each other. It doesn't even have to be a pure power game, right? Especially if these are very powerful guilds or organizations and you have characters like um like glint glint isn't going to want to um overtly flex power like right with his flaw he secretly believes that everyone's beneath him but is he above setting one faction against each other the uh, the characters themselves can inspire intrigue can inspire conspiracy and suddenly you uh maybe early in the in this uh sample in this uh thought quest uh, that we're having uh, if you as the DM set up okay so th the head of the monks is corrupt and is causing some problems and that's after you know an intro adventure everyone gets together there's a battle everyone got their first bloody lip as a group and they say okay well things are getting kind of serious uh, we need to investigate this um, and then I don't know Glint can deputize them because he has that ability hey we just made something up but it seems to work right um, it's not like any, everyone's going to be far away anyway. They all live close together. So you just sort of throw up the uh, the bat signal. <laughs> or you have Radia, who's uh, rooftop to rooftop anyway a lot of the times, is the, the rally person. So they have these different roles in the group. But then, uh, you know, in order to uh, to overcome this, you have the, the transmuters, who the, maybe there's a rivalry between this monk order and the transmuters for some reason. Well, Glint may offer... or uh, well, why don't we set one faction against each other and this could resolve itself in a more natural fashion and I get to keep my hands clean. And uh, this could then spotlight, oh, well, Gwelevi here might have some inside information because she remembers sneaking something in. And so the wizards might be able to be leveraged through blackmail. You know, um, you might be able to bribe them if there's money or something. Or you could end up taking a side quest of some kind. The transmuters need you to put down the uh, the invasive aberrations. They need you to go and uh, secure a caravan that has a lot of very expensive transmutation potions and things. And so we can have an encounter and some world building in that way. But there's different ways you could approach then earning the trust and favor of the, the transmuters. Because, right, there's not a wizard here. There's not a direct link. 
But it think if there was in the in the party, then this would change the adventure. Com well, not completely, but uh, you could use other tactics in order to get the same result. Um, Hatarika has her own unique uh, visions, or maybe she stumbled across something in her random comings and goings. Because everyone else is rather is rather methodical in their own ways and in, in what they're doing. Sandvon could have heard a rumor, or he could spread rumors. And suddenly now uh, you have the Transmuters Guild, who is politically, uh, you know, well, maybe physically, because that was one of the traits that was going on uh, in the city, is unfortunately there's some leadership that's in open revolt. And so now you have this wizard school that's set against the monk order, but is it enough? Is, you know, being harassed politically... Um, a viable tactic. Well, maybe not by one rival, and so you go to the other. You go to the Thieves' Guild if you really wanted to, or you go to one of the religious foundations, or you go to a civic foundation, something along those lines, and we've now just... We've taken an entire quest, an entire module, or even an entire campaign, and it's going to a location, interacting with it, and finding, uh, and finding these things interacting with them and setting them against each other all in a, a small you know a small and intimate map in the grand scale of things so that is uh that is the the pitch for the campaign these are the ideas this is how you can just sit down and over the course of several hours uh if you're having writer's block this is an awesome way to bust through it trust in the dice roll <laughs> roll with it and go from there uh, and so as I finish this up, um, I wanted to also give one last piece of advice, uh, and this is DM to DM. Uh, when you make a <laughs> when you make a campaign or a module, make sure it has a fun name. So for instance, uh, we had uh, Lies Under Klabheim, and that was a bit of a pun because there was this uh, there was actually another portal, and that led to that that campaign's warlock's fiendish um, pact holder. And that was a compelling part of that story. And there's a portal here, though. Does it? Does this portal really play an integral role? It just seems to be more environmental than anything. And so think, how can you describe your campaign with something that, that will be memorable, an inside joke, a pun, some other play on words? Nothing that's a big convoluted anime title. <laughs> Those are very popular nowadays. Um... Uh, so let's say that we went with the, the criminal organization. Uh, you know, you want to bring down the thieves' guild, or you want to you want to uncover the corruption here. Um, we can name this campaign here. I'll write it down here. How about that? Whoops! I'll make it bigger. The Tianese racket. <laughs> Looks like tennis, right? <laughs> but in a racket is, you know, uh, it that's like a criminal activity. It's a racket. You know, think like organized crime, that kind of a thing. You've just summarized what the group is doing. You've made it memorable. And as a DM, you're kind of flaunting your own, you know, you can pat yourself on the back. The Tianese racket. <laughs> so there we go. Um, did I tell you specifically what the Teenies Racket is? Um, I haven't laid it out as a module. I may go back and, and actually do that. Uh, but with this special video, it was it was really world building from the ground up and not really going too much above a couple hundred feet above the ground. We weren't bird's eye view like we were with Clabheim or Lelly Wellen's Folly. So, ta-da! The Teenies Racket. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. And uh, please uh, keep watching on YouTube for uh, the recaps and the things that we talk about. And if you want even more, hop on hop on Twitch when I'm broadcasting. Be a part of the conversation. Lurk. Ask questions. Um, it, it's open. It, it's open. We're role players here. We're storytellers. Um, I may not have experience in something, but you'll encounter someone in the chat who will. It's an open and friendly chat. You've probably seen, well, I moved myself over to the side to make room for the chat because it's it's very active when I'm broadcasting on Twitch anyway. <laughs> Remember, this was a standalone. Anyway, thank you again. Have an awesome day. I hope your brain is just, yeah, I can do this. I'm a storyteller. I got character ideas and story ideas and a novel idea, and I'm going to, you know... I'm going to get on and do this. Have fun with it. <laughs> Take care.